afternoon. Okay, listen, I come from the Marine Corps, and where I come from, that was weak and undisciplined. Let's try that again. Good afternoon. Oh, thank you. Oh, good, good. Leave the, leave the door open for like two, two more minutes, because I want them to hear what we're about to do. All right, so uh, I've been downstairs in the uh, basement drinking coffee for the last six hours. And um, so we're going to do something that I used to do with my Marines. I was in the Marines for like 20 years. And we use a term in the Marine Corps. It's a term of like inspiration and motivation. Does anyone know any Marines? Have you ever heard a Marine bark like a dog? Ah! Like that. That's actually a word. Uh, Marines have never been known for like speaking incomplete sentences or pronouncing words properly. So there's a word. And what we're going to do with this word is we are going to do room A is better than room B with this word. Okay. And I'll show you what that means in a second. But I'm going to kind of do like a little competition first. So Paul, your side, just stand up for a second. I'm going to ask you a question. And if you agree to the answer to the question, I just want you to give me a motivated Marine Corps hoorah. And it comes from right down here. All right. You with me? Okay. So if you're motivated, dedicated, ready to be here today, would you please say hoorah? That was good. That was good. Okay, sit back down. Stand up. I know you can do better. But we're going to do this as a group in a second, okay? So if you're motivated, dedicated, ready to be here today, would you please say hoorah? Hoorah! All right, that was good. Stay standing. Stand back up. Here's the deal. There's a whole bunch of people in room B that need to be in room A. Okay, so what we're going to do is give them a motivated Marine Corps hoorah that's so strong and powerful that they're literally going to look up and go, I don't know what that was, but that was pretty motivating. Would you do that with me if you would? Let's do that. Okay, so here we go. If you are motivated, dedicated, ready to be here today, would you please say hoorah? Hoorah! That was good. Give yourself a hand and have a seat. I appreciate that. That got us started today. So you can, they, if they're not coming in now, so no, here, here they come. Thank you. All right, so, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about innovation. But before I do that, I want to take you back just a little bit and ask you a question, which is this. What do you do when you have 10 seconds to live? I was actually faced with that decision back on a July night back in, in 1999. You see, I was a Marine Corps fighter pilot. And as a Marine Corps fighter pilot, we actually train with the Navy, which we never like to admit. But at the end of our training, we do our carrier landings. And then at the end of that training, we do our night carrier landings. Now, there's a bunch of countries, nine to be exact, that land on aircraft carriers, uh, China, India, Ireland, just to name a few. But the only country that does it at night is the United States of America. Did you know that? Yes. It's bravery and courage and no, it's none of those things. It's crazy. Why would you do that? Because when you land on an aircraft carrier, it looks like this, which you sh you're not supposed to take pictures from airplanes, by the way. So I have no idea who took this. I found it on the internet. I would have never taken this picture. It's like the most dangerous thing that you can pro probably do in life. That's what the carrier looks like. But, um, but really, it actually kind of more looks like that, actually. But then at night, that's about right. Okay, and so you, you look at this thing and you're like, why would you land on something like this? And, and what they do when you go to train, uh, you, for like three years, you have an instructor in your backseat. And then when you go to land on the carrier at night, for the first time, you're alone. Which I can't figure out why they would do that to this young pilot. I think it's risk mitigation. Like if he's going to die, it might as well just be him, you know. And so I went to land on that thing at night. And, and, and frankly, it was a beautiful night. The moon was out. The stars were out. Everything was incredible except for starting at about 700 feet above the water and ending at about 1,200 feet above the water was a really thick cloud layer. And that cloud layer would be the source of a pretty significant problem for me that night. It shouldn't have been. I had trained to fly through the clouds, no problem at all, and land on a carrier on my instruments with, with no issues. But that night, a condition came upon me which can only be described as vertigo. Have you ever experienced vertigo before? That's like really dizzy, disorienting. The best way for me to define it, if I was to stand you in the room and spin you around about 20 times and then stop, that really dizzy, disoriented feeling, that's vertigo. And as I descended in the clouds at about 350 miles an hour, about 10 miles behind the USS Stennis, which I hadn't even seen that much of it at this point, uh, I felt what I felt as I hit the clouds was a gentle rolling sensation to the left. Now, some of you are pilots, and even if you're not, when a good pilot feels his or her airplane rolling to the left, what do they do? You take the control stick and go where? to the right. And as I started to do that, I looked up at my heads-up display. It tells me if I'm climbing, descending, turning left, or turning right. And according to that instrument, I'm flying straight and level. Now, at this point, my rolling sensation picks up. It's harder to the left. And as I go to move my stick to the right, I look again at my heads-up display. And according to this display that I'm pretty sure is completely broken at this time, I'm flying completely straight and level. Now, at this point, my brain and my body sensation is telling me that my airplane is in a massive spiral to the left. That at any minute, the clouds are going to go away and the Pacific Ocean is going to show up and then I'm going to slam my $40 million airplane into the ocean, ending my life prematurely at 24 years old and destroying a $40 million airplane. And as I go to move my stick now, 
there goes that mic again. Um, so, as I go to move my stick violently to the right, and as I'm about to go take this airplane, which, by the way, is flying perfectly straight and level and turn it literally into the Pacific Ocean, the quite opposite of the direction that I thought it was going, as I'm about to turn my airplane, I hear a voice. Now, have you seen the movie Star Wars? Yes. Okay, so you remember when Luke Skywalker was going to bomb the Death Star, and then he heard a voice from Obi-Wan Kenobi that was like, trust your instruments, you know, or, or, or trust your targeting computer, or whatever that voice was that he heard. Okay, so the voice I heard was not out loud. It wasn't like Obi-Wan Kenobi, but it was the voice of training. And it was a simple line that I just said, actually, a simple line. I heard three words. There was the voice of my instructor that I heard in my head that said this, trust your instruments. It was really simple, just trust your instruments. It was a very simple instruction. Frankly, flying an airplane into a carrier is very complex. There's a lot of speed, there's a lot of physics, there's a lot of forces across the air, airframe, there's a lot of physical forces and biological things that are happening in ones and zeros shooting through the middle of an airplane, but when it really came down to it, it came down to three simple words, which were simply trust your instruments. And so I had a decision to make. I could trust myself and everything that I knew to be true, or I could trust my training. I could trust the complexities of what I was feeling inside, or I could trust my instruments. Do you want to know what I did? I'm alive before you today because of that, because I decided to trust my instruments. Broke out of the clouds at 700 feet, saw the back of that aircraft carrier, decided that was time to land on it, and executed. I, I, this is the part of the story I don't like, because I'd like to just tell you that I'm like the second coming of Iceman. I executed the single worst landing that they had seen that night and probably had seen that month. But as I rolled out at the end of the aircraft carrier on my first carrier landing, did I care about my horrible grade? No. Because I was alive. Because I was alive. Because I was alive based on a really simple principle, which, um, which was simply trust your instruments. And so today I'm just going to talk a little bit about speed and innovation. Okay, And I'm going to give you a damaging admission when I start off today, which is this. Number one, I failed kindergarten. Okay, so I literally, the only memories I have of that era was, I have no memories of kindergarten, the room I was in kindergarten. I have only memories of the room where I went to get in trouble. Okay, so I failed kindergarten, so I always knew in life that I wasn't going to be able to succeed based on just intellect alone. The second thing is I'm a Marine. And like I said, Marines are standard. To get in the Air Force, you have to have like three, a 3.8, 3.9 GPA. To get into the Marine Corps, I'm not exaggerating when I tell you, you have to have passed that is the requirement in. They literally, if you want to see it, you can see it online. Minimum GPA of 2.0. That's like passing. That's literally all they're asking for in the Marine Corps. And the third thing is, you probably know a lot more about blockchain than I do. Especially if you work inside of the industry. Now, I consider myself a, a owner and I consider myself an investor, and I'm certainly interested in it, but you probably know more about the technology. But what I'm really good at is speed, innovation, and communicating very difficult and complicated things. And what I'd like to do in our time together, and we can just open it up for some questions, is share with you what I think is key in terms of this technology, in terms of taking it, frankly, from conferences that are like this into a technology that every single person talks about and literally buys things with on Amazon. Okay, because it has come a really long way, and thanks to Moore's Law, you're familiar with Moore's Law, right? So every 18 months, basically, technology doubles. And so if you look at the growth of, of blockchain or Bitcoin, for example, you, you always have those like really early, early, like really, really, really early, early, early adopters that all basically get thrown in jail. Like the history of the world is that. I mean, all of the main innovators always take these huge arrows, and that's where the beginning starts. And then it hits this sort of critical mass, which is about where we're at right now. Listen, if Warren Buffett, who just yesterday, was it yesterday or today, if Warren Buffett is talking about Bitcoin, it's about to hit mainstream. Okay, when, when, when Jamie Dimon says something about Bitcoin, like you look at what Warren Buffett says, and you, and because, you know, okay, so he said basically Bitcoin is, is a bubble. I think it was Donna that you, did you say something about this this morning? So um, I don't know if you saw her talk this morning, but it was outstanding. Um, and so uh, when somebody, I, I found it ironic because what Warren Buffett said was, uh, Bitcoin is like in a bubble. And um, he, he referenced back to the internet boom and the bubble, and, but I read his, the article that I read, that had his picture on it, was on the internet that he was talking about that had the bubble, right? So you think about that for a second and you realize, you realize like there's like, you know, like 
it made it, you know, it kind of made it. And so the point is, I just want to talk about what I think uh, in a lot of ways as an outsider, but kind of like an insider in some ways, what it's going to take to turn uh, the, the, in this technology into something that we're literally like actually using. Okay. Cause a lot of, I don't know, I don't know what you do with it, but my guess is you're saving it, right? Isn't that kind of true? Okay. So how do you go from one to the other? So let me just tell you, I'm going to go back to the aircraft carrier for a second. So when you go to land on an aircraft carrier, remember, uh, Marines land on aircraft carriers and the minimum was 2.0. Uh, and it's a very fast environment, a very fluid environment. And when you're communicating, sometimes things happen like microphones break. Okay, so our communication on the carrier, because it's life and death, is precise communication. So here's what happens. When you come in to land, if you're a little bit left, they, the, the person who's the LSO who sits on the end of the aircraft carrier, if you're a little bit to the left, the LSO will say, come right. But if you're a little right, he'll say, left for lineup. Did you catch that? He doesn't say, come left, come right. He actually changes the way he says something. And that way, if he says, for lineup, you know that you're coming left. That's how precise the communication needs to be. If you're high, the LSO will say, you're a little high. But if you're low, the LSO will say, power. And if you're really low, what will he or she say? Power, power. And if you're really, really, really low, like I was on that one night, what will they say? Power, 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 and you'll hear them start stepping on each other on the radio to do it over and over again. The point is the, pr the communication has to be precise, okay? Which brings me to my actual first point when it comes to this stuff. I only have a couple little points, and then we can do um, some, some questions and just have some fun. The first point is this. Certainty is currency. I'm going to give you the, the best example that I can think of. Okay, so right now, in, look, here's the thing. For the purpose of this discussion, I don't care who you voted for in the last presidential election, and, uh, and it doesn't matter, okay? It actually doesn't even matter who I voted for in the last presidential election. If, do you wanna know? Would it help you to know, by the way? I voted my conscience, and I wrote in myself. I'm not joking when I tell you that. So, I, okay, so, um, so, and by the way, I honor, and I honor, look, I'm a Marine, so I honor the Office of the President of the United States, and I honor the person that's there. I think it's important to honor our national leaders, okay? So there's a lot of that. That, that goes on, but I'm the kind of person that looks at the decisions that someone makes as like one decision or the other. You know, some of them I agree with and some of them I don't. That said, whoever you voted for, the 2016 election was literally this. It was the election between someone who spoke with 100% certainty and someone who didn't. Okay, I, I, I'm not making a political statement here. I'm not even saying what he said was right. What I'm telling you is you have a person who spoke with 100% certainty. We are building a wall. It wasn't like, listen, here, Warren Buffett did say this. He said, people don't spend a lot of money on it depends. I've been using that for years as a consultant because, listen, when I, the work that I do when I come into organizations and work with companies like yours, I come in and I go, do this because it'll work. And when I say, do this, it'll work, it should work. That's speaking with certainty. And I'm here to tell you, I'm, I'm just telling you what's going to happen over the next five to seven years in our country. And you already know this. Okay, so how's, what, what is our stock market built on right now? Pretty much, a, like, consumer confidence is like a nice way to say it, right? What is, what it, I could use actually vulgar terms to say it at this point, but like, have you, I mean, we're looking at like the, the highest price to earnings ratio in the history of the stock market, okay? You've got consumer debt at an all-time high, business debt at an all-time high, student loan, the student loan situation, which is bubble, bubble proportions like it was back in 2008 for the loan, for the loan um, industry. What's going to happen with our national stock market? I mean, just, let's just face it. What will happen? It's going. I don't know when. I, I thought it was like a year ago, frankly. I'm really bad at predicting times, but I'm pretty good at predicting seasons, okay? So that will happen. Second thing, our dollar currently is uh, significantly higher valued because it's used as a trading platform across the world for petroleum. So petrodollars are the trading feature of our dollar. There are two countries right now that desperately want to get America out of the, out of the dollar being based on, um, oil being based on the dollar. Who are those two countries? Russia and China, 
Okay, so sometime over the next five to seven years, you will see a shift in the petrodollar being changed into something else. When that happens, all the statisticians say that consumer, economic consumer disposable income will get dropped in half because of what happens around the world. So in a time where our country is going to move into a significant economic challenge, okay, with some significant leadership challenges, let me ask you this question. When you look at Washington, D.C., whatever you believe in, whatever side you're on, Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, I don't care. By the way, I don't use any of those terms to label myself. It would be helpful to know. I choose not to. I don't even use the term like libertarian. I don't choose to use those terms because what you believe is probably all over the map just like me. Okay? So how are you feeling about our leaders in Washington right now? I have not met one American who's like, Psh, A plus grades. Nobody. Okay, so trust it on our leadership and our government, justly so, by the way. Okay, that's at an all-time low. Uh, family values, all-time low. Uh, crime rate and, and violent um, shootings, all-time high. So we are literally in one of the most difficult times. They just did a poll. 71% of Americans believe that we're, we are worse nationally than we were during the Vietnam War. Okay, we have, we have massive challenges, massive challenges as, as a country. But here, I'm also here to tell you, that the future looks amazing. Because check it out. Nobody does anything in our country when things are just OK. Like during the 80s, like when things were like just OK, no real change happened. It didn't. Like nothing significant happened in terms of innovation during just OK. But when things really are horrible and, and people are starting to lose money and people are starting to feel it in their inability to buy like milk and groceries, what it does is it opens up the door for new technologies to come sweeping in and completely revolutionize, uh, completely re revolutionize everything. So in the 80s, in just OK, an, a technology, I know the technology didn't exist, but if it did, in the 80s, there's no chance. Because people don't feel it, right? People don't feel the pain. But in 2017 and 2018, when it's really painful, this will start to look really interesting. OK, so the first thing is, if you have these technologies, the most important thing that you can do, in my opinion, is communicate with certainty. You have an answer to a problem. Like, we are printing, we have $20, million, $20 trillion debt. We're printing a lot of money. We have a major issue. And if you could stand here and just say, look, I have a very democratized answer to this problem, which does not include federal governments. And you can explain people in simple terms, which I'm going to talk about in just a second, how they can simply utilize something like this to create more value and wealth in their lives and their employees' lives and other people's lives, you will build an amazing business. You will have probably a lot of followers and fans, and you will help change the world. Did you catch that? So in this is what happens, though. Most of the time, in times of uncertainty, we get like frustrated, and we're like, gosh, I can't believe it. This is the time for leaders like you to simply step up and say, this is a solution to the problem, and to communicate that effectively. By the way, when you do that, you should expect that some people might disagree with you, but that's good too. Think about that for a second. What if everybody, if everybody agreed with you, that means that you've written a book that got four reviews on Amazon. But if you wanna write a book that gets 4,000 reviews on Amazon, you might just have some people saying bad things about you, okay? So think about that. So first one, uh, is this helpful so far? Is it, if it is, say hoorah. All right, good, you guys are great. All right, second one. Second one is this, uh, clarity is cash. Okay, now, I told you, because I, I was like a little bit of an outsider into the, into the uh, blockchain world, into the Bitcoin world, and now I consider myself a little bit of an insider, frankly, thanks to you, Paul, because Paul took me under his wing, and ba like he took like this, like, I really, I didn't know anything, basically, and Paul like taught me a lot, like really did. I learned a lot just from learn. so thank you for that. Um, so Paul, uh, and then I did my own studying, and then I, you know, did my own investing too, just for fun. So, um, and so as an outsider, but as a person that works with hundreds at this point now of companies and industries, as a per I, I didn't tell you much of my bio because we don't have much time, but I do, I do a lot of consulting and a lot of high-end work with a lot of big brands and companies where I come in and help people work specifically on innovation, communication, branding, and marketing. So how to communicate effectively into the marketplace. So I took a lot of that what I knew into my sort of first ventures into Bitcoin. And I'll just tell you, one of the biggest challenges in my opinion, this is all my opinion, by the way, facing the industry right now is clarity. Okay, let me just describe some of the conversations that I've had when it comes to uh, clarity. So I was getting my hair cut like two weeks ago. 
by the same girl that has cut my hair for like two years. She said, oh, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to Cleveland to speak at this event. And then I'm flying to Austin to go speak at the Texas Bitcoin Association event. And she goes, oh, Bitcoin. She goes, I really want to buy some of that. She goes, the problem is I can't because it's too expensive. And I said, no, well, you get to, like, she gets paid 50 bucks or 60 bucks or whatever she gets paid for. I said, you can just take that 60 bucks if you want to and put it into the thing. You get $60 of Bitcoin if you want. And she's like, really? Okay, so what I'm telling you from that, it's not just that conversation, but generally speaking, like, like I said, this whole room, in that room over there in B is full of early adopters, right? But the problem with early adopters, and I've been, I've been studying this and listening and reading, the problem with early adopters is, like, we're standing up on stage talking to ourselves, you know? And, but here's the thing. The average American person who will be using this currency in the future does not understand what a blockchain is. They don't know what a hash is. They don't know what a smart contract is. They don't know anything at all about the networks, and they never need to, ever, okay? Because I want you to remember who this person is. So first of all, imagine, I want you to imagine this guy, okay? He's in Iowa. Nothing against you if you live in Iowa, by the way, okay? He's sitting in his computer late at night, but he's got one of those computers that's got a screen that has like a mile of plastic behind it. The monitor was built in 1995, okay? He still has a mouse that has a connection with a wire all the way to his big, great big gigantic hard drive. And his mouse moves really slowly. He hasn't adjusted the settings, so he actually picks up the mouse and moves it. You know when you see people that do that with their mouth, mouse? That's that person right there, okay? And in, in five to 10 years or less, that person, that 65-year-old man who uses a mouse like this has to, has to be able to use this to do something with it. How do, you, how do you explain that to him? Does that make sense? So, so think through communication and what that means. Because when we do it amongst ourselves, or when coders do it amongst ourselves, or when we talk about building networks, that's a conversation that has to happen. But think about this for a second. Back in, I'll go back to 1995. So back in 1995, you had a Netscape Navigator. Does, does anybody use, remember using Netscape? Then you had Yahoo had a browser that had like... I Mosaic. Mosaic, yeah. There was, there, what was the one before? There was like the original... Yeah, okay. So, so and then, okay, so like, and Yahoo, you t then Yahoo came out. You type into Yahoo, and, and Yahoo had like 4,000 things on their page to choose from. And then a company came out that completely and ever since then has dominated, and who is that? Imagine the Google search, imagine the AltaVista, that's good too. So imagine the Google page. What did the Google page have on it? They had a box, and they had Google. That's it. They literally had Google and a box. And I remember watching people type into Google and go, it took 0.3 seconds. For the, remember when it said at the top, it takes 0.3 seconds. They were amazed that it took 0.3 seconds, okay? Because clarity's cash. Google summed, summarized it all the way down to just one thing, relevant returns. That's all. It's just simply that. Okay, so my encouragement is to create certainty and, um, and clarity in the way it gets communicated. Thank you. Like, for example, um, I don't know how you're going to do this, but right now it's difficult for people to understand buying 0 0.0157 of a currency. It's just the way that it's built, okay? So I have no, I've, I don't have any other solutions other than to like, maybe 0 0.0001 is called something like a bit, which they use in science fiction, right? So like, Four bits, I think that's gambling, isn't it? Isn't that actually gambling? Maybe you should change it to something else. My point is, how do you communicate? You can't change, I know you can't change certain things, but how do you communicate that? You with me on that? If you are, say hoorah. That's, that, that's by the way, that's, those two things are what, are what will bring it into the mainstream, okay? Uh, last thing, and this is literally, I'm gonna land the airplane on this one. Uh, oh, shoot, so um, uh, before I forget, so this book right here, which I wrote, it's called The 21 Day Miracle, will help you get anything done faster, 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 because speed is my thing, okay? In it, I talk about money, I talk about business, talk about health and relationships. Um, you got two choices. You can go onto Amazon, you can buy this for $8.30, or you can have it for free. Which one do you want? Uh, Paul and Linda actually bought copies for every single person that registered, okay? So that was their gift to you. 
Um, so thank you for that. Thank you. Just goes to show how much they care about your education, okay? Uh, all I tell you, all I have to tell you is just read the first four sentences, you'll get the whole thing. All right, so just, just read the first four sentences. That's all I'm asking you to do. Uh, and thank, make sure you say thank you on your way out to Paul. They're at a table out there, uh, and I'll sign it for you if you want me to, but it, like value goes down. So if you want me to, if you want me to do that, I will. Um, okay, last one is speed wins. So I think, who is it I was talking to? How many, how many um, cryptocurrency companies have launched in the last year? Something like 1,000? Is that about right? The number that I heard was roughly about 1,000. Uh, of those 1,000, how many will make it? Ten. Ten, 10 will be big. One will be huge. One will be huge. Two, two will be, one will be huge. One will be a small competitor. Eight will be big. Uh, maybe eight, 80 will hang on, and about nine, 900 will be gone. Okay, the biggest difference between the one, the two, the eight, and the 900 will be speed. Simple speed of implementation. Speed of network, actually, which is what you guys do really well, right? Network speed is actually really important too, transaction speed, but actually more than that is market speed. So for example, how many of you watch movies on a Betamax right now? No. When Betamax raced against VCR or VHS, who won? VHS, Betamax had a better tape, higher fidelity tape. VHS won because of speed to market. When you walked into a movie rental store like Blockbuster, there were 90% of the tapes were VHS and about 10% were Betamax. So you, when you went to Sears, which is its own lesson, by the way, when you went to Sears to buy a machine, you bought VHS because of speed of implementation into the market. Uh, the automobile was invented by a guy named Henry. No, it was actually invented by a person named George Selden in 1879. Ever heard of George Selden before? He invented the automobile. Actually, he took Henry Ford to patent dispute and won. And on appeal, Henry Ford looked out the window and said, Your Honor, I see a whole bunch of Fords down there, but I don't see one Selden. Henry Ford won simply because of speed to market. Okay? And so as a company, as a company leader, or as someone who works inside of an organization, the most important thing that you can do with clarity and certainty is create speed to market. Are you with me on that? If you are, say hoorah. hoorah. All right. So that is literally, I just... I'm trying to jam like an hour and a half into a half an hour, so we got it. We got about two minutes left, uh, before, and then we can open up for some questions, right? We got like 10 minutes or so. Um, so with that, let me just kind of wrap up the page. So, um, so I took you back kind of the, to the aircraft carrier. What I'll tell you, um, just, to sort of, just to sort of take us back full circle, is this. By the time, so I was this young student that finally landed on an aircraft carrier, but by the time I left the Marine Corps, I was the number one instructor in the Marine Corps for one against one dog fighting, which is when we fight against each other. Um, did a simulated fight. We, real airplanes, but simulated missiles, by the way, just so you know. Um, it would be bad for morale if we shot real missiles at each other <laughs> in training. Or good for morale, depending on who you're fighting against, I guess, at that point. So um, what I learned during my time is this. The F-18 turns at about 70 degrees per second. A, a winning dogfight means that you've got about 180 degrees. In other words, you've gotten behind your enemy. So how many seconds do I have to turn at 70 degrees to, per second to get to 180 degrees? About three, a little, little less than three. So what I learned very simply was my best dogfight engagements happened when I made three one-second decisions faster than my opponent. I saw a little bit of an advantage, and I made a, a, a split-second decision one second faster. Your key in the industry that you're in is to create the kind of scenarios where you're making simple decisions significantly faster. You with me on that? If you are, say hoorah. hoorah. All right, you, now you can hand out. Does anyone have any questions? What do you got? Yes, sir. So the company I work for is trying to bring this to Yes. So what would you think are the most important things for people like in Iowa, for example? What are the most important things do you think that we should try and like push out so they would adopt. Yeah, so like I said, the most, the, so, so here's, here's the, the challenge, because uh, I've worked f uh, for and I've worked with and I've, uh, worked, I've worked for and with and also founded and built my own software companies. And the challenge with software, or the, a lot, I'm just making an assumption, but mo a lot of this is based on code and software, right? So the challenge with software is you end up with feature, feature creep, as you know. Right, so you end up with at, you end up adding things like so. For example, there's some there's some really great software demos that are happening outside right now. Right, so when you look at that, what happens is a bunch of engineers come to an event like this, 
and, the, and, and like we all look at the thing, and then a bunch of engineers are like, huh, but what about this? And then the CEO is like, oh yeah, we should probably add that in, right? And so the biggest challenge that I've seen, like the one software company that I consulted and was like a percentage partner on for a really long time, uh, almost killed itself because of feature creep on really, really good things that kept getting added in, right? So super simple on the interface. Like the GUI has to be, I'm, I'm not exaggerating, it has to be a 75-year-old person with Parkinson's should be able to actually simply operate it on any device. Just ba basic GUI type of stuff. I didn't know that, uh, know that uh, I'm sorry, I don't want to offend anyone who's 75 and has Parkinson's, okay? So I should, a really wonderful person in that older age. <laughs> I just, you know, you never know who you're going to offend these days, okay? So remember I told you our country's moving into a stage of, okay, so let's go back over here. Anyway, uh, and then simplicity, so, so that's, on the, that's on the delivery side, which you actually do, but then simplicity on the communication on the marketing side. You have to be able to say, like, like, like when people walk up to me in the hallway and they're like, oh, Ed, hey, what are you speaking on? I need to be able to say that in like a sentence and have people go, oh, I'll come in and listen to that, right? Because you can't be like... Well, you know, I was born in Westchester, Pennsylvania, you know what I mean? And the challenge is with people who create amazing systems is oftentimes they're not like, they they're, have a hard time at communicating like all the ones and zeros that are flying through their head, communicating that in a very super simple way, right? Which is why Google's so amazing and still to this day so amazing because they were able to simply describe their business, which, which by the way now has a thousand different ventures underneath of it, but they were able to describe their business into a simple search return. You, you get your first, you get the answer to your search on, on the first return, you know, which was revolutionary at the time. So, like for example, um, pizza. So who, who totally revolutionized pizza? Domino's. Domino's. How did they do it? Simple, they, they had a simple way of describing it. Does anybody remember it? They don't say this exactly the same way anymore because they got like sued and stuff. What, do you remember the original hot, fresh pizza delivered in 30 minutes, or guaranteed, or less, guaranteed? That is like the most simple, unique selling proposition. Now, in any of that sentence, did they say that it was good pizza? Nope. They never said it was going to taste good. They didn't say anything about the toppings. They didn't say, like, you get the New York style. They just simply said it was hot and fresh, delivered in 90 minutes, guaranteed, and they were marketing to high college students. So all they wanted was 30 minutes, pizza in 30 minutes. Okay, so just think about that for a second. So just think about how can you, sum, how can you take what you do and summarize it down to the single thing that makes people go, huh, okay. And by the way, you wanna know how to do that? Here's what you do. You go out with people and you simply spend like, you go to events like this, because when you go to events like this, it's like, hey, it's Ed, I'm, my name's Ed. What's going on, what's your name? Alex. What do you do? No, see, but, that, but what I'm saying is that's how you fix, that's how you figure this stuff out. You go, what do you do? And you say, so what I do when I go to like networking events is I try like 18 versions of the same thing. And when people go, huh, huh, well, that's interesting. I'm like, I, I got something, right? So here's what I do. I teach people how to get 12 months of results, uh, 12 years of results in 12 months or less. Does that make sense? I teach people how to compress time and do more in 21 days than you've done in the last year. That's, that's what's called a unique selling proposition, right? But it takes time to like work on that, and that's how you do it. You start telling people stuff until they go, ah, oh, oh, okay, it makes sense. Good question, that was a good question. What else, what, you, what else you got? Anything? I could just keep going on and answering your question if you want to. All right, anyone else have a, a, any questions or comments? Anyone have anything like, oh yeah, go ahead, Craig. Here, hand Craig. I just wanted to uh, make a parallel observation here. Yeah. I've seen a lot of like uh, political consultants and stuff, and what you're describing is the 30 minute or 30 second elevator speech yes. when you're trying to sell yourself. That's exactly and, right. And that, although, the, the, yeah. although in today's market, the 30 second elevator speech is about eight seconds, right? Yeah, That's a literally sure. like the attention span. So yeah, right. yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, I, I just was that. Oh that yeah. Was a comment. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right about that. And by the way, this is also a function of our culture, and I'm not making a cultural statement other than to say we're not as smart as a culture as we used to be. Like, if you read stuff from the – I'm reading this History of America thing right now, and I'm in the 1600s. If you read the writing in the 1600s, you're like, whoa, dude was smart. Like, they use big words. You have to, like, look up. 
on in your Kindle, you know what I mean? Like you're, the, the, it's just a different era, okay? And we, we're different in the way that we communicate. We use, we use letters to say things now. We just go LOL, you know? Like we don't even use words anymore. So the point is you have to do it quick and you need to do it to the point because the attention span is typically very fast. How long does it take the average person to decide whether or not they're gonna stay on a website? Yeah, it's two to six, depending on whatever the study that you see. Oftentimes, it's a three-second decision. So when people start making changes to the bottom, below the fold of their website, you're like, whoosh, whoosh, go back up and test all that stuff first, right? But the point is that. And then on the political side, the devaluing of the American intellect is significantly a challenge. You saw that, actually, in, in the last election. You saw somebody, this is instructive. I'm not making a political statement. You saw someone who was talking as though they were speaking to fourth graders, okay? The English, if you took uh, President Trump's, candidate Trump at the time, speeches and you dumped them into the internet system that tells you the grade level, it floated in about the fourth or fifth grade level. And if you took Hillary Clinton's, they were significantly higher. And I'm telling you that Americans respond, look, here's the thing. If someone's confused, what will they do? They won't do anything. And they certainly won't, t you've, been in, you've been in talks here, I know I have, You've been in talks here where you were like, I don't get that at all. And in the midst of that, you don't go, um, I don't understand what you're saying. Because it's embarrassing for us to do that. So I sat in the back and I'm like, I'm gonna have to go look that up on the internet. You know what I mean? Like you don't ask. And so the point is, if your customer doesn't know, they'll never tell you and they'll never work with you. So you, have to, so you do have to make, this is really simple, but it's so hard. You have to make it, you have to talk about it like a fourth grader. You know, how does that work? It was really easy with gold because you just handed someone, like you came in like the old Western guys with like a bag of gold. You know, bing, feed my horses. You know what I mean? Like that was easy. That was so simple. But now it's not. So, but figure out how to make, a way to make it simple again. You know, and when you do that, you'll probably make like $50 billion. You know, like give me a call, give me a call and ask me to, you know, Give me a call and give me like a small percentage of that thing before we, before you go and do it, and I'll help you. I'll help you with the, you know, I'll help you with the, uh, with the, uh, with the communication. Anyway, all right, we're gonna. Any anything else? We got like a minute and a half. Are you good? Are you glad you came? Get your book. Make sure you. Go, hey, by the way, I think we have a couple enough of these. So if you have, uh, if you have a teen at home, um, the, this generation is the future, and um, we we need to make sure they make it. So uh, if you have a teen at home, take another one and bring it home to them. All right? Yes, sir. I want to I I jump in here and say uh, we, we actually went up and, and grabbed this man and made him come uh, to the conference. And um, I want to say that I have read a lot of self-help books and stuff, and, they, and I get about three pages in, and I think this is an idiot, and I throw it away. Um, I really, really like opening up a book and the first thing it says is that um, this is dedicated to the entrepreneur, someone who is set on changing the world for good and will stop at nothing to get there. And that spirit's running through this book. So it is, it is actually useful. Um, his concept of sprints, we're doing this in programming now. We don't, we don't try to program for six months. We try to program for two weeks because you don't have enough concentration, you know, come on, most engineers can't concentrate enough to get to lunch. Um, you, and, and so we have to do things in short sprints. If you can learn to do a sprint to your next goal, like he suggests, um, you, know, you know, you're gonna see your life change and you're gonna be able to change the world. And that's why I had him come here and I hope y'all are really appreciate it. And those, those of y'all that are watching this on the video, I hope you really, really uh, get the message that we're trying to disrupt the world. And yeah. thanks a lot, Ed. Thank you. Yep. Thank Ed you. Rush.